if you look at the Sourland region, it's just this mohawk of green that streaks through central New Jersey, and it really looks like a perfectly contiguous forest. There was this band of forest in the sour lands of about 25,000 acres that kept showing up as significant and unique. So we saw this value in it in terms of its ability to store carbon, protect the water supply for wildlife and rare plant habitat. Uh, so the sour lands came up in many different contexts as being important. It's important that people understand uh, what a treasure the Sourlands is and how much uh, work needs to be done uh, on the individual level and on the community organization level to preserve the, uh, the beauty and the um, important environmental contribution that is the Sourlands. We're losing over a million trees and that is devastating. So in 2021, we've set a very ambitious goal to plant 21,000 trees in partnership with folks throughout the Sourlands. Um, it's a good start. It's our next step. Growing up in the Sourlands, uh, being born and raised, uh, you don't think much about it. It's, uh, I think like most people, your hometown is what you're used to. And as I grew up, I didn't think much about the Sourlands. When I moved away, uh, that's when I realized it's special. It's incredibly stimulating, stepping out into the big woods of the Sourlands. There's so much to experience, so much to see, so much to learn. There's really no place like it. Refuge here in the Sourlands means um, safe places to nest and safe places to molt and safe places to refurbish um, during migration and a safe place to overwinter. But, but it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's uh, wonderful for people too to come through and see the beauty and, and get that feeling that you're in the middle of nowhere because all you see is trees and, and shrubs. So in that sense, it's a, a refreshing um, refuge for people, too. It's not just a place that we have to talk about defending against human impacts all the time. It's a place that I feel can inspire people. It can be a template. It can be a place to go and say, look how beautiful this landscape is. Look how it's organized into something that is not only like aesthetically charming or quaint or has beautiful vistas, but a place that really um, stimulates our senses. We're in the center of the universe here. I absolutely love it. And at the same time, I can walk out my back door and get completely lost for an entire day, an entire week if I wanted to. So for me, it's that idea of being able to be in the heart of it all and be completely unplugged all at the same time. The animal life, the ecological balance uh, gives, uh, gives us a place for recreation. It's wonderful for biking, uh, wonderful for birding, uh, wonderful for getting out and enjoying the tranquility, and uh, reliving some of the rich history of the area as well. It's not a tourist location where you come and you get entertained. It's a place you go to get renewed to really have as a refuge, to have as a sanctuary, and also to get inspired.
Sourland Mountain sits in west-central New Jersey, in the area bounded by the towns of Princeton, Hopewell, Lambertville, Flemington, and Hillsboro. The 90-square-mile region spans seven municipalities in Hunterdon, Somerset, and Mercer counties. Sourland Mountain is home to the largest contiguous forest between New York and Philadelphia, and it is a remarkable place. For centuries, the Sourlands have been a refuge for plants, animals, and people. In the middle of the nation's most densely populated state and adjacent to one of the world's most heavily developed corridors, the Sourlands provide critical habitat for wildlife and a peaceful, inspiring getaway for people from the neighboring cities, towns, and suburbs. The Sourlands are a rich regional resource, unique in many ways. You will see the Sourlands not only as an ecological oasis, but also as a place of refuge and a source of inspiration. In 1778, George Washington made his headquarters here at the Hunt House in Hopewell Township. Perched on Sourland Mountain, he had a commanding view of troop movements from many miles around. In this modest building, Washington held a grand conclave of leaders of the Revolution and planned his strategy for the Battle of Monmouth just a few miles away. His victory there swung the momentum of the war toward the colonial rebels. A few miles in the other direction, John Hart, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, took refuge in the Sourlands from the British who were trying to track him down and kill him. Later, Sourland Mountain was part of the Underground Railroad. Its remote location and deep woods were ideal for hiding escaped slaves. In this region, it was very common to have enslaved labor. By the mid-1700s, there was roughly 12,000 slaves in the state of New Jersey. This church here was built by the free and enslaved African Americans from the Sourland Mountain community. And the mission of the Stoutsburg Sourland African American Museum is, is to tell the story of the unique culture, contribution, and experiences of the African American community in the Sourland Mountain region. There's a purple haze over my life Sometimes I'm doing you wrong Even when I'm thinking right And I try to make amends With all my foes and my friends I don't want to meet my maker There ain't in all these blue sins And I'm trying Yeah. 
This is a place that I like because I feel like I can see the bones of the land exposed here. This is what a lot of the Sauerlands looks like, but because there's been a stream coursing through here, there's no more soil and you can see all the boulders exposed. This is Diabase. This is the rock that saved the Sauerlands. So while many of the adjacent lowlands to this area got turned into farms or became industrialized, became suburbs, the Sauerlands stayed wild. Why? Well, you can't plow this stuff. Because it was poor for farming, the development here was held back for a long time. It did not get developed in the way that the rest of New Jersey's more prime farmlands did get developed. So it's here simply because of this accident of geology. It was difficult to put roads in here. It was difficult to do things with water, like have wells. And most importantly, it was impossible to plow this landscape. So the parts of the Sauerlands that had this diabase geology underlying them um, were able to stay, at least relative to the rest of this area, very wild. The predominating diabase is a hard, igneous rock formed from the crystallization of underground magma. The large diabase boulders that characterize the mountain are the result of erosion and were not deposited here by glaciers, as many mistakenly assume. Eroded diabase created a number of dramatic rock formations that have captured the imagination of people for centuries. Colorfully named places such as Roaring Rocks, Three Brothers, Devil's Half Acre, and Knitting Betty Rock figure prominently in the legends and lore of the Sauerlands. The Sauerlands diabase restricts the amount of water that replenishes the local aquifer, which is not a flowing underground river, but mere isolated pools of water collected in the cracks of the bedrock. The groundwater, upon which everyone who lives here is completely dependent for their water supply, is very difficult to retrieve, and it's a very limited resource. So when it comes to groundwater, we have only a very finite amount of it. Experts agree that the region's water supply cannot withstand the pressure of significant further development. In addition to placing further demands on the limited supply of groundwater, development threatens the drinkability of the water supply as pollutants from septic systems automobiles, and other sources inevitably make their way into the groundwater. While groundwater is critical to the residents of the Sauerlands, the area's surface water is also important. Springs feed the headwaters of pristine Sauerland streams, which contribute to the drinking water of thousands outside the Sauerlands region. The area's unique geology allows the formation of perched wetlands and vernal pools, which provide critical habitat for endangered wildlife. So da ba 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 da ba
dun dun dee dun da ba dee ba da What burns and glows without flame What lives and grows without any rain What brings a smile that only lasts a little while It makes me cry without shame Well then how can you please me, torture and tease me And do it in the name of love whoa, 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 whoa. Don't you know how to be nice You'd leave me without thinking twice You're warm like an oven Always ready for my loving And then you go from fire to ice Well then how can you please me, torture and tease me And do it in the name of love whoa, 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 whoa. Am I coming? Am I going? Well I got no way of knowing your mind You make me rise, you make me fall You make me stumble, 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 stumble and crawl, baby, get with it. Come on, admit it and whisper to me if you don't really love me anymore. How can you please me, torture and tease me and tell me that you're doing it to me in the name of love? You're doing it in the name of love. 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 You make me rise, you make me fall You make me stumble, 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 stumble And crawl, baby, get with it Come on, admit it And whisper to me if you don't really love me anymore How can you please me? Torture and tease me And tell me that you're doing it to me In the name of love, you're doing it in the name of love You're doing it in the name of love, you're doing it in the name of love You're doing it in the name of love, you're doing it in the name of love The Sourland Forest is home to a broad range of mammals, including bears, red foxes, and coyotes. Beavers, woodchucks, skunks, and possums are among the smaller mammals that live here. The endangered bobcat is a native to the Sourlands and has been seen here recently. Abundant native plants support the largest colony of birds in the region, from the tiniest hummingbird to the king of raptors, the bald eagle. The wide variety of amphibians and reptiles in the Sourlands are a reminder of the rich diversity of wildlife that was once found throughout New Jersey. The Sourlands provide a really rich environment. Uh, you know, from a bird's eye point of view, uh, this is one of the most attractive sites you'll ever find. If you're flying up the East Coast uh, and you're a bird, you're going to want to land <laughs> in the Sourlands. Millions upon millions of birds travel every spring and fall along the Atlantic Flyway, an aerial superhighway that stretches along the eastern seaboard from South America to northern Canada. A crucial component of the flyway is the forest stopovers below. The Sarlins is, is a bit of greenery between highlands and Cape May, and the birds come down to roost and feed. It, it's a stopover for migration. 
where they can refurbish before they go on. The stopovers are like links in a chain. The disturbance of any one threatens the entire flyway. This is particularly true in the heavily developed northeastern United States. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the birds are in decline because those nasty people in the tropics are cutting down the tropical rainforest. Well, most of the birds that, um, that are around here live in the tropical rainforest in the winter, but they come up here because food is abundant and it's a good place to raise your family. And so if we don't provide that for them, um, then it, it has the same effect as it would if you were cutting down the rainforest in the tropics. Many songbirds stop only briefly in the Sourlands on their way to breeding grounds elsewhere. The black-throated blue warbler stops on its journey from its winter home in the Caribbean to its nesting territory in New England and Southeast Canada. Other birds, like the junco, call the Sourlands their winter home and migrate further north during the summer. The Sourlands are more than a stopover for the migrating birds that breed here, such as the endangered eastern meadowlark. It takes advantage of the abundant grasslands at the foot of the Sourlands for nesting. Birders have watched with delight as the Kentucky warbler has been seen raising a family on Ballpate Mountain on the western edge of the Sourlands. Its cousin, the hooded warbler, also prizes the Sourlands large tracts of mature deciduous forest with dense shrubs. The female hooded warbler will often build the nest in a clump of dead leaves so it's perfectly camouflaged. And she will sit in it. If she sees a predator, she will drop to the ground and scurry away, trying to draw the predator away from the nest. The male hooded warbler, in the meantime, will circle around the core of the nest. You can often hear him and with patience see him. He will stop only um, briefly to feed. The evolutionary purpose of that is probably to let other males know, this is my territory. My woman is here. You keep out. One of the most beautiful and most vulnerable birds in the Sourlands is the scarlet tanager. Its gorgeous red feathers and jet black wings stand out among the greenery. These birds are especially sensitive to forest fragmentation as they breed only in deep forest interior. In addition to the migrants, a long list of birds live year-round in the Sourlands, the largest of these being the majestic raptors that live in the forest interior and roam above the adjacent fields and grasslands, eyeing prey. The red-shouldered hawk is extremely rare in the Northeast because of declining habitat. Red-shouldered hawks breed in this reserve. I was privileged in 2008 to see a pair go through courtship and a few months later, about half a mile from the spot where I saw the courtship, I saw an immature red-shouldered hawk that had just fledged. So they're not often seen or heard, but they are here in small numbers. Other year-round residents of the Sourlands include the chickadee, a variety of woodpecker, and several types of owl. The barred owl is the real specialty of the Sourlands because it's the one owl in our area that requires large contiguous forest. But you also have great horned owls breeding in the Sourlands. In bygone days, the night call of the owls was heard throughout the eastern forest. The Sourlands is one of the last places in New Jersey where their calls can still be heard. In late winter and early spring, another type of call dominates the hills and hollows of the Sourlands. Amphibian migration is a spectacular phenomenon that happens in early spring. And on cool, wet nights, amphibians, including salamanders and frogs, will emerge from their wintertime burrows up to the ground 
and migrate from upland forest to small pools or medium-sized pools in the forest called vernal pools. And these vernal pools are the sites of their breeding cycle. So salamanders, specifically spotted salamanders and wood frogs, will court and breed and lay their eggs in these ponds and only these ponds. And the reason we see this rush is because vernal pools are exactly that, vernal. They're wet for several months during the year and they have to get in their entire breeding cycle and the larva has to mature before they dry. Because vernal ponds aren't full of water the entire year, they can't support fish. And fish are fantastic predators on amphibians and on eggs and on their larva. So the significance is that there's much less predation in a vernal pool, which makes them excellent nurseries for amphibians. Reptiles and amphibians whose numbers are in sharp decline worldwide can still be found in abundance in the fascinating forested wetlands, ponds, and pools of the Sourlands. Cracks in the diabase boulders throughout the Sourlands provide a wonderful habitat for the black snake, garter snake, and ribbon snake, among others. The endangered wood turtle finds the Sourlands clean headwater streams and woodlands to be a wonderful home. Loss of habitat due to forest fragmentation is the greatest threat to these venerable creatures. The first spring rain brings a symphony of spring peepers. Each vernal pool, even if very small, can provide refuge for hundreds or even thousands of spotted salamanders and frogs. Spotted salamanders are the largest salamander we would see in the Sourlands. Females are typically larger than males and max out at 10 inches in length. So if I put her on my hand, she would stretch from fingertip up to my wrist. We don't see them very often, A, because they're fossorial and underground and nocturnal. And the one time we do get to see them quite regularly is on these migration nights. Wood frogs are cool because they can get quite cool and are one of the only species we know of that can have two thirds of their body water freeze solid and still survive. When a wood frog is frozen in winter, it is not breathing and its heart is not beating. And it can carry this out for several days. So it's in a suspended animation until there's a thaw cycle again and its body actually starts to thaw with the ground around it. And so once your wood frog is thawed and back <laughs> um, with a heartbeat and back breathing, there is this uh, period of wait for them before they migrate. They will be active again, but they have to wait for the right conditions for an amphibian migration night. When conditions are right, a rainy day and chilly evening, the migration begins. First wood frogs, followed by salamanders and other amphibians, trek back to the very same vernal pools where they were born. Unfortunately, the ancient roots are now crossed by roads, which makes the migration very dangerous. Mortality is high. The Sourland Conservancy and other conservation groups organize volunteers to help the amphibians get safely across the roads. I think it's a pretty magical event, giving themselves to help these small creatures that fit in the palm of their hand get to a breeding pool. So it's a magical moment for me, um, again, just to watch people of different ages participate in such a phenomenon. Oh. 
As soon as I walk into a woods, I feel a wave of well-being come over me. It's not a unique phenomenon. It's not something that some tree hugger like me alone can experience. In fact, the Japanese have a word for the air that exists in a mature forest as, because they've recognized that it's different. For many, being in the woods is a calming contrast with our everyday lives and invokes a primal sense of well-being. A forest that goes on without interruption provides shelter, serenity, and refuge. For people, this is a source of enjoyment and inspiration. For some plants and animals, it's a habitat that is critical to their survival. The Sauerlands region may be the last refuge of some of the complex plant communities that once flourished in New Jersey. Skunk cabbage is one of the earliest plants to appear each year, producing a furled cone in marshy woodland areas while the ground is still frozen. This plant is capable of thermogenesis, the ability to emit heat. This allows the skunk cabbage to melt its way above the frozen ground Spring Beauty is another early bloomer. A perennial herb, its pink-tinged white flowers appear in early spring. The showy orchis blooms from April to June before the forest canopy is fully leafed out. The white petal of the showy orchis provides a wide landing platform for its main pollinator, the bumblebee. The eastern redbud is a small understory tree it is related to the Judas tree, but has pointed leaves and is slightly smaller. In New Jersey, it's an endangered tree, and the Sourlands host its largest population in the state. Cardinal flower is a perennial that grows up to four feet tall and is found in wet places, stream banks, and swamps. Hummingbirds are attracted to its nectar. The bottled gentian blooms in the fall in the moist woodlands and meadows of the Sourlands. 
Its blossoms have five fused petals that never open and resemble buds. If you look at the Sourland region, it's just this mohawk of green that streaks through central New Jersey, and it really looks like a perfectly contiguous forest. However, these roads and lawns and this patchwork of open areas in the Sourlands is actually detrimental to uh, what, what you can really define as a contiguous forest, because each of those open areas has a buffer around it uh, where the surrounding forest isn't quite as productive as it could be and uh, isn't ideal for some of the specialist species that can be found here. The Sourland Forest faces a major threat from development. Clearing deep woods for a home site diminishes habitat a thousand feet in every direction. Yeah, there, there is a, a big difference between the interior of a forest and the edge of a forest in terms of what plant species uh, are likely to occur there. Um, interior forest is an increasingly rare thing in central New Jersey because we put all these roads and houses and commercial buildings and every time we do we create more, more edge and so you get what is, what is referred to as a fragmented forest. By maintaining the forest interior you not only get all of the plant species that um, are not able to survive on the edge, but you also get the animals that uh, depend upon those plants. So that there are a number of birds, for instance, that um, only live in forest interiors. And so the importance of having some edge, but a lot of interior, is that it uh, provides uh, life to many more species of plants and therefore many more species of of uh, wildlife. Development in the heart of the Sourlands destroys deep woods habitat, while increasing habitat for the highly destructive white-tailed deer, the second major threat to the Sourland forest. One of the really important imbalances in the Sourlands is that we just have a huge deer population throughout the whole region. And it's partially because the type of suburban habitats that we've created, one, we've eliminated all the large natural predators from our human habitats, but we've also created habitats that uh, deer have adapted to really well. And we've created a, sort of an outrageous population imbalance. I think nothing made me sit up straighter and realize that there is a, a dire threat than hearing a woman named Ann Rhodes say that if deer aren't controlled in another 200 or 300 years, we will not have an eastern forest because the trees that are in the canopy now will have died, largely died. Some of them will survive a little longer, but most of them will have died and there won't be anything to replace them because the deer will have eaten all of the, all of the seedlings. See, this, this substrate here is park light. It's all been eaten out by deer. Um, anything that tries to come up, our hardwood seedlings will be eaten this winter. So you don't see any ash or shag bark or oak trees that are three feet tall or over. You just won't. As a result of deer browse, there are huge swaths of Sourland forest in which there is virtually no understory, no next generation of trees. Compare this with an area of healthy forest understory. Whether they're the result of development, storm damage, or other natural causes, holes in the forest are taken over by invasive plants. These invasives, unlike native plants, are inhospitable to native birds and animals. The overpopulation of deer compounds another relatively new threat to the Sourlands, a devastating invasive insect called the emerald ash borer. Emerald ash borer is almost always fatal to ash trees. The Sourlands have a higher proportion of ash in their forest than the rest of the state. So they're looking at a bigger impact from emerald ash borer than other forests around the state. This is an emerald ash borer larva. They uh, bore into uh, ash trees and lay eggs. The larva then hatch and start eating the vascular tissue and they create what we call a gallery. So that's this pattern you can see in the bark here. 
And they, as they create this gallery, what they're doing is they're cutting up the vascular tissue inside that tree. The forest we're in right now is an oak hickory forest with a component of ash. And you can see the ash component is starting to die off. And when we look at the sourlands and we figure on average, ash trees make up about a fifth of that, that forest, that leaves a pretty big gap in the canopy. And the question is, what comes in after that? Do we have a new generation of trees or do we have other things coming in? And I can see around me here that there are a number of invasive species that are occupying that space rather than trees. We're losing over a million trees and that is devastating. So in 2021, we've set a very ambitious goal to plant 21,000 trees in partnership with folks throughout the Sourlands. It's a good start, it's our next step. We're planting a variety of native trees and shrubs to ensure diversity, which is critical to our habitat. For this restoration plan, we used tree tubes to protect each individual tree. And it protects the tree until it grows up tall enough to be able to get out of the browse line for the deer. Here in the Sourlands, deer are everywhere. There are actually 12 times more deer here than the forest can sustain. The problem with that is that they're hungry. They eat a lot of food, and the food that they're eating is actually habitat for other birds and animals. Some of them are rare, endangered, threatened species that can't survive without that habitat. So the deer are literally eating the other animals out of house and home. So we could see the forest transform into an ecosystem that doesn't function properly or doesn't store carbon as well as it could or may not be a forest anymore depending on how aggressive the invasive species are in colonizing the forest. Everyone from all over New Jersey can help by practicing good stewardship at home, by caring for the environment, and by supporting this initiative. It's important for New Jerseyans to be engaged in their forests and participate in managing their forest resources. Even if you don't own forest land, you can make choices that have impacts on the larger forest as a whole. And as you can see with the Sourlands, what's inspiring about it is it's a relatively small proportion of the state's forest, but it has a potentially huge impact on the resources of the state. I can see clearly now the rain is gone I can see all obstacles in my way Gone are the dark clouds that made me blind It's gonna be a bright, bright, sunshine and day
So the sour lands are a depletable resource that, um, you know, obviously when you cut down the trees and, and clear the fields that it's done forever. In the case of the sour lands, I think that's less easy for people to, to look at and say, okay, what's the big deal when, when you cut down the trees, so what? And I think the so what is that uh, it's a symbiotic relationship with us and the, the sour lands, us being the people um, and the farming and uh, where we live and the refuge that it's become. Once that stuff is gone, it doesn't come back. And it, it's not that they move to a new place, that the Sourlands are a, a refuge that um, if they're gone, uh, we lose a lot of stuff that goes along with it. Nearly three times the size of Manhattan Island, the Sourlands are New Jersey's own central park. Although it's not all parkland and much of the Sourlands has not yet been preserved, the area provides a large natural space where people from the surrounding towns and suburbs can come to enjoy a wide range of recreation. The Sourlands are great for cycling, hiking, hunting, horseback riding, birding, photography, and bouldering. There are abundant opportunities for deer hunting and fishing. There are dramatic rock formations where people come to climb, and miles of beautiful trails where hikers can be in the woods and see 200-year-old white oaks, vernal ponds, clear mountain streams, and the countless pleasant surprises that nature offers. Just outside the Sourland Forest along the flanks of the mountain is one of the most active and robust equestrian communities in the country. The region is well known for the many trails that crisscross its woods and fields, where a variety of trail rides are held frequently. Bicycle riders from throughout New Jersey gravitate to the Sourlands because the area offers plenty of ups and downs with cathedral-like woods opening to breathtaking views of the surrounding valleys. Well, I for one like to bike through the Sourlands uh, because I think about the history, I, I appreciate the, the wildlife and the forest diversity, and I am often reminded that this treasure is in the middle of the most densely populated state in the country. To keep it pristine, but also keep it in a natural balance uh, is really important. The ability to be out here hiking or cycling and just in some ways both lose yourself and find yourself at the same time is the, is the beautiful irony. A visit to the Sourlands offers a respite from traffic and crowds, an unlikely refuge we share with plants and wildlife. The Sourlands provide inspiration, its natural wonders reminding us of both nature's resilience and its fragility. We are fortunate in the heart of New Jersey to have the opportunity to experience a real forest and enjoy lovely mountain vistas. We have something here that's worth protecting, something that's very beautiful, something that is easily encroached on by suburban sprawl, and by other uh, things that could really change the landscape here in dramatic ways. And it's, it's a real choice that people make in terms of, you know, is this something worth protecting? I think most people do respond to the idea that um, 
they're, they're not an island, that they do live uh, in a community. And the goal is to enlarge their sense of that community to include the natural areas that, uh, that surround them. Yes, I want to be able to turn my tap on in my kitchen sink in 10 or 20 years and know that the water is going to be there and that it's going to be clean. But I also want to know that we have held on to something that is a really exceptional resource that my children and grandchildren will be able to see a little slice of New Jersey's agricultural past and our beautiful ecosystems. You know, we tend to talk so often about people as bad actors within the landscape, as only causing disturbance and degradation. And I think one of the reasons why the idea of stewardship appeals to me is because it allows us to resume our role as very important animals within the landscape that encourage abundance and resiliency. In 2021, we've set a very ambitious goal to plant 21,000 trees in partnership with folks throughout the Sourlands. It's a good start, it's our next step. We're going to develop a framework and a structure for the forest to be able to regenerate. We're going to plant understory so that it will grow up and create a diverse tree canopy. It's important that people understand uh, what a treasure the Sourlands is and how much uh, work needs to be done uh, on the individual level and on the community organization level to preserve the, uh, the beauty and the uh, important environmental contribution that is the Sourlands. Like the Sourlands, NJ.com is a valuable New Jersey resource. NJ.com keeps us informed. It serves as a relentless advocate for New Jersey's most vulnerable and a watchdog holding our state's leaders accountable. Please support this essential resource at nj.com slash subscribe.